Ja, Marc, molt bé. Vale, això no funciona, no? Encara? Com es fa? So, sorry for the delay. We have finally everything set up, so we can record the lectures. So now we have Laura de Altaixer. She's a guest lecturer from Technical University of Munich. And she will have, like, Few lectures now. Uh, she will introduce herself, but that's right because I, I don't really know at the end. There's going to be some slight changes from the original program, but just for the best of you. Okay. So thank you very much, Laura, for coming back to Barcelona again. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know if this is working. Probably not. Yes, it is. We can, is it? Yeah, we can see the recording. Oh, okay. Cool. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So um, yeah. Welcome everyone. So these are. Uh, pretty much last minute slides because uh, Xavier told me that you already know about a lot of things. Um, so you have already heard about similarity learning, which was one thing that I want to talk about initially. And uh, you already know about autoencoders also. Um, so I'm going to start from your knowledge of autoencoders uh, to talk a little bit about image synthesis and style transfer in the first lecture. And just as a spoiler, there's not going to be any generative adversarial networks here. So everything is going to be supervised and very boring. OK, so a uh, small recap, two slides on autoencoders for those of you who, are, um, who might not know about it. Um, so uh, in Vision, we use actually quite a lot of autoencoders to get from an RGB image to an output that has the same size. And this can be essentially um, from an RGB image to a segmentation, semantic segmentation mask, or from an RGB image to a depth map or uh, any other prediction that we would like to have in image space. And the autoencoder, uh, it's called like this because it takes the image, performs a series of convolutions and poolings until you reach what is called the bottleneck layer, which condenses, compresses all the information. And from that bottleneck layer, we're going to scale up with a series of up sampling and up convolutions uh, to get the output that we actually want. And this can be trained end to end if you have correspondences from RGB image uh, with the semantic segmentation masks. So um, here the, the key, there are several keys into getting uh, pixel accurate outputs and one of them is actually uh, the upsampling. So there are several techniques for upsampling and this is kind of one of the key design choices uh, for autoencoders. And another key design choice to actually obtain these really precise uh, pixel, for example, boundaries in case of segmentations is actually um, the skip connections. So um, in skip connections, what we do is we copy information from the encoder to the decoder. And this is because we're losing quite a lot of spatial information when we do the convolutions and pullings. When we reach this um, bottleneck layer here, we have lost pretty much all of the spatial information. So using the skip connections is actually one way to get it back. Um, so again, I, I already assume that you know enough about autoencoders so that we can um, skip to the, next, um, to the next task, which is actually um, how do we actually use autoencoders in vision and how do we get from autoencoders to style transfer and what kind of losses can we use there? Um, so the, the first or one of the first successful applications of autoencoders was SegNet, so the, um, a network that actually went from the RGB image to the actual um, output semantic segmentation. Um, and this actually gets pretty nice results. So for example, you can see here uh, that for a variety of inputs, which are usually in outdoor um, autonomous driving scenarios, we can get actually quite accurate predictions. And um, so in a couple of, of lectures, so still today, uh, in one hour or so, I will present actually uh, how to compute confidence maps on these predictions, which is also interesting for autonomous driving. So for now, we assume that we get these uh, pixel-wise predictions and we trust them to be correct. So another application is that of uh, monocular depth. So now there are uh, pretty much um, thousands of networks that compute monocular depth. And this was one of the first ones, and I really like this method because it's actually unsupervised monocular depth prediction. And this means that um, you really don't need pairs of input image and depth image, but you can train this in an unsupervised way if you have a stereo camera. So what you do here is you use basic um, computer vision, multiple view geometry, uh, to use the left image and the right image 
uh, to actually get a depth prediction. So this is kind of your ground truth, which you have created from your pair of images. And now what you can do is you can say, well, I want to obtain a depth from only the left image with a CNN. So I'm going to train a CNN for that to obtain this depth map. And my loss is essentially going to be, I'm going to check with the right image whether um, with multiple view geometry, really basic equations, whether I can use the depth to warp the pixels into um, the left image, into the right image, sorry. Um, so what happens essentially is you're just doing cross-check. So you're saying, if I do have this depth really in my scene, then uh, the pixel in the left image should correspond to that other pixel in the right image. And then you can just compute the photometric error, and this is going to be basically um, your loss function. So this is sort of an unsupervised way of computing depth and training a neural network for that. So of course at test time what happens is that you can forget about steps two and three, and you just have your neural network which predicts depth from uh, a monocular, so from a single image. Um, so what happens usually with these networks that compute depth from a single image is that they are inc incredibly overfitted to the type of scene. Um, so you will usually see these types of scenes, these, these kitty types of scenes, autonomous driving type of scenes, where um, the geometry is always the same. So you have um, always this kind of, um, of geometry. And therefore, the depth, even if you put it, uh, if you use your neural network and you give it an image of an indoor scenario, it's going to predict a depth map that is going to resemble pretty much what you see in kitty. So these networks are usually incredibly overfitted. And so much of the work that people have done is actually to try to generalize these models um, to various indoor and outdoor scenarios. Um, so another thing that one can do is actually image super resolution. And this is also a really nice application where you have a low resolution image and you want to obtain a high resolution image. And um, the, the main problem is that the content of the image, which could be you know, an outdoor scenario, indoor, with objects, without objects, um, if you use a normal autoencoder, you have to pass all the content through the autoencoder. And this is actually um, wasting the resources of the neural network. So what people did was, um, well, why don't we actually just try to learn the residual, which is a much easier task. So essentially what you do is you get the low resolution image and uh, you upsample it with any technique that you want, any classic image processing technique. And you assume that you have it available at the end of the pipeline. And now what the neural network has to do is just compute the residual, which means whatever you have to sum to your upsampled low resolution image in order to obtain the high resolution image. So with this, the neural network doesn't have to learn the content. The content is passed through this connection here, and it just has to learn to sharpen the edges that are already there. And this is also, um, this can be done with a, a series of architectures, um, but the most common way of doing this is, again, with an autoencoder. And finally, and the, the um, kind of the goal of this, of this mini lecture is to talk about actually image synthesis. So some people said, well, look, um, we are trying always to predict from real images, predict the semantic maps. But uh, we know neural networks need a lot of data to be trained. So why don't we get semantic maps and we create synthesized real images from that. And if you look at the images, actually, it looks pretty realistic, especially from far away. So those of you at the end will be super happy with this slide. Um, and the thing is that this is not using any type of generative adversarial training. And so the question is, um, how can you actually get these realistic images without any type of adversarial training? And so this is where um, I actually want to, want to come with the, the point of the, of the lecture. How can you do this without guns? And so um, the first thing that, uh, or the first loss um, that one uh, uses when it's trying to reconstruct an image is the L2 loss. So this is the classic loss for, for any type of supervised um, autoencoder training. The problem is that um, if you, for example, synthesize the black car, this is as valid as synthesizing a white car, but the L2 loss is going to be very different for these two cars. And only the color has been changed. So we don't really want to judge the appearance, we want to judge the content of the image. 
And so uh, what some people have been using uh, for, uh, for this particular task was what is called um, the perceptual laws. And so um, I want to discuss a little bit what, what do I mean by perceptual laws, what is this actually, and how it was introduced first for style transfer. So it was not introduced for, uh, for image synthesis, but actually for style transfer. Um, so the, um, the content laws, also called perceptual laws, um, so it has several names, but um, the main idea is that you don't want to judge the appearance, you don't want to compute a loss on the appearance of the image, but you really want to judge the content. And so people started to think, well, um, if you actually train a neural network, let's say AlexNet, for image classification, um, and you look at the features, you look at the responses of all, of all the features that you have trained, you already see that you have um, all these kinds of parts of the objects, um, geometrical features. Um, you can already see them appearing in your feature channels. So what people said was, um, well, why don't we actually use a pre-trained network? So let's take AlexNet, for example, train for image classification, and use it to compute the loss. Um, so uh, it is worth noting that we're not training the network for our particular lab task, we're just using the features of a trained network. So for example, we go to layer five, take those features, and we're going to use these ones to actually compute the loss. And uh, how the loss is actually computed is essentially by saying, uh, I'm going to compare the features of my generated image and the features of the ground truth image. So in a high level, um, the, the high level idea is that if I have a car in my ground truth image, I will have the same activations as if I have a car in my synthesized image. And the color, for example, doesn't matter. So this is exactly what this um, feature um, distance is measuring. And this can be taken at any layer j. So again, uh, what we should do to actually compute this content loss is take a pre-trained VGG network. So again, we don't need to train this network. Uh, we pass the generated image, we pass the ground truth image, and we compare these feature maps. And so, um, just to put a bit, more, a bit more detail into these formulas, these are going to be the feature maps of the generated image at a certain layer J, and this depends on the application, what, uh, what layer do you want to use, and you're going to compare it with the feature maps of the ground truth image at the same layer. And there is uh, nom some normalization that needs to happen so that you can compare um, different features at different layers, but aside from that, um, that's the gist of it. So once this is done, um, we can actually now start comparing the content of the image. So again, if we have a car in the original image, we want to have also a reconstructed car in the synthesized image. And so um, the channels that are activated by the wheels of the car, the windows of the car, these are all going to be the same in the generated and in the ground truth image. And this is what we're going to measure. And um, again, this ignores color, which is exactly what we actually want. Um, so this was first introduced for, uh, for style transfer. And what style transfer does is it takes an image, um, which is called the content image, from which we actually want to extract the structure. And uh, we have also then a style image, from which we only want to extract the style. And what we want to get in the end is actually the content of the first image with the style of the second image. So this is, um, for example, you can see all these shapes of the houses that you can see in the first image, but the style has been completely changed according to the second image. And in order to do this, you can already think that uh, we're going to apply our content loss to the content image so that we can see similar houses in the image that we're generating. And uh, this actually works pretty reasonably well for uh, some of the styles. Some others are too crazy, but that's uh, to be expected. But if you take reasonable styles, actually, you can get quite nice artistic results. And if you actually Google for this, you will see millions of uh, of images with millions of styles. Um, so the, um, we have already seen that the content loss um, measures um, feature similarity. So for example, VGG or AlexNet feature similarity from ground truth and generated image. Uh, but we also need another element to create this uh, stylized image. 
And that is actually the loss that measures the style. So we want to preserve the content, but we also want to preserve the style of another image. And the style loss is a little bit uh, less intuitive, uh, but it also uses the features of um, the trained BGG. So you can see here that you're also using the features, again, comparing the generated image with your ground truth image. But instead, you're not comparing directly the features, but the gram matrices. And the gram matrices are indicated by this, um, by this letter G. And so again, what you would do to compute the style loss, very similar to the content loss, you take the pre-trained network, you pass both images to the network, and you compute the gram matrices at a certain layer, uh, which gives you basically this, um, this formulation here. And so um, the gram matrix, what, is actually, what actually does, is it compares, um, as you can see, a feature in a certain layer J. So you still stop at the same layer J, um, but now what you're going to do is you're going to compare different channels here. So you see before that we're taking the whole um, layer J and we were taking the full activation map, comparing the ground truth activation map with the generated activation map. But now what we're going to do is we're going to compare different channels within one particular image. So for the generated image, we're going to compare different uh, activations from different channels and for the, um, for the ground truth image, we're going to do the same. And the rough idea about um, comparing the different channels is um, that we actually want to measure a different thing from the content loss. Uh, we want to measure which features tend to activate together. So for example, if there would be um, vertical edges activating together with horizontal edges, um, this value would actually be very high for the channel that detects uh, vertical edges and the channel that detects horizontal edges. And this kind of correlations is what we actually want to measure here. And um, so it, it is not super intuitive why this actually preserves um, the stylistic features but not the content. Um, and honestly, myself, I also see that sometimes this is not working too well. So the content loss is, is straightforward and it works uh, for most of the tasks where we try. The style loss is a, bit, a little bit more hand wavy. Um, but the, the general idea is to capture um, this, this correlation between feature activation. And so um, what one usually does is uh, with, with naive um, style transfer is you actually start with a white noise image and then you keep doing forward and backward passes and you keep updating uh, for the two losses. And you see how the image is changed and it keeps adding, first of all, the style of the image, and second, it adds the content of the image, like these houses that we were seeing before. And this is actually an iterative procedure. And of course, what you can do then is uh, you can give more or less weight to the content loss or to the style loss. So you can keep the content more, or you can make it more abstract if your style image is abstract. So you can actually control this. Um, the problem is that this is again an iterative process, so you have to do many passes through the BGG, forward pass, backward pass, change um, the original white noise image so that you get this, this pretty image in the end. And what we would like actually to do is um, to do this in a fast way, so to do this in one forward pass. So what people have then proposed is, well, why don't we actually train a neural network to do the style transfer? Now the bad thing is that you're going to have to train one network per style, so this network can only create that style, but at least you only need a forward pass um, to actually create the stylized image. Um, so what you do is, is you take multiple content image and use the style image to actually compute the loss, which is always going to be this style loss with the grand matrices. And this loss is um, pretty much always going to be on the same image, but the content loss is going to vary because you're going to have different content images. And so what you do is basically you use this autoencoder that turns this image into its stylized version with um, the computation of this content loss and this style loss. And so of course at test time, it's really fast because you only need to do one forward pass and boom, you get the stylized image. Um, so I've put here like 
other um, uses of autoencoders if you are interested in them. Uh, what I find super interesting is actually um, what some people call deep multimodal autoencoders. And these are the autoencoders that actually mix uh, different, different sources, for example, audio and video, or written text and video, or nowadays pretty much anything with, uh, with images. And this is usually done at the uh, latent space of the autoencoders, the autoencoders of the different sources. And so it's, it, there's quite a lot of interesting work on that. Okay, so um, this is the end of the first mini lecture. So I think it's better if we have questions at the end of each session so that we can break also a little bit. So do you have any questions? Yes? Um, so you said that the first uh, two laws that was used, so it, like the perceptual laws is comparing the features. The L2 loss is just pixel difference, okay. right? So this would be the classic loss that would essentially give you blurry results. And so this is not a loss that you want to use for image synthesis. Yeah. So for example, we used in, in we have a, a submission um, where we do temporal video super resolution and using the perceptual loss was actually really useful to get really um, good looking uh, video super resolution um, outputs basically. So if you have any task where you say, well, I don't want really to go through all the efforts of training a gun, for example, to get, to get image, um, good image representations, then you can use this, um, this loss to actually get really nice, um, nice looking images. Okay, so, yeah. Thank you.